The farrier trade is a very important and crucial one to the horse racing industry. In South Africa, we are blessed with some of the best. We are going over to Robbie Miller. He's just been inducted into the Horseshoeing Hall of Fame. Let's catch up with him, get a bit of his background, and he can give us a great insight into the global ferry industry. We're here today, we're at Drockenstein Stud, and we are with the one and only Robbie Miller. Robbie, put it there. The first South African inducted into the Horseshoeing Hall of Fame. Yes. How does it feel yeah, to be famous? No, it's, it's, it's amazing. I'm, I'm humbled. I mean, you know, the guys that have put me in, that have voted for me, are the who's who in our industry. So to be respected and honoured by my peers like that is a, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, and I mean, you had a there was a 12, 13 strong list of potential inductees on this, and obviously you've you've won the vote. So I mean. Let's touch a little bit on your career as a farrier. That's got you to this pinnacle, and obviously you're, you're an authority, not just nationally, I mean, everyone looks to you here in South Africa for your opinion, especially on, on vital horses, big horses, but obviously a global authority, you know, as the induction into the Hall of Fame goes. Tell us, we've always asked all our guests, how did you get the horse racing bug? Where was the intro? You've come from a bit of a racing family, but where was the first shoe you put on? How did you learn about the farrier trade? Um, so my, both my late dad and my late uncle were apprenticed here in Cape Town. My uncle went on to ride for many years. I think he rode in excess of 2,000 winners in his career. And then he went on to train horses, Arthur Miller. Um, when I was at school, a friend of mine was actually shoeing horses for his dad. And I don't know if many people know the Newtons or have heard of the Newtons. Neville Newton used to train way back and uh, Mark and Craig, his sons, were shoeing the horses and, I, and they were my friends. And uh, at that point I saw I was starting to get a little bit big to become a jockey. So um, I enjoyed food and yeah, I saw Mark and Craig shoeing horses and I thought this is something that I could like. And um, subsequently I got called up to do my national service and uh, as it normally happens, you go where you don't want to go or they send you where you don't want to go and I landed up in the Air Force. Okay. And I uh, did my national service, but I still I wanted to shoe horses. And um, I signed on permanent force and I went to Bereda back in those days, the equestrian centre. And I did my apprenticeship there under Grant Store. He's very well known in the dressage mm -hmm. um, disciplines and that now. I think he's, he's at um, Old Summerhill Stud. Yes. I think he's involved there now. So that's where it started. Fantastic. Yeah. So you come out the army, you're a young guy. You, um, decided now you're going to be a farrier. Early years, when you really did those hard yards, hard hours, I mean being a farrier is hard hours, no matter how successful you are, it's a labour intensive yeah. job. I always look at you guys and I think, my goodness me, I could never work that hard. But you've now built yourself a fantastic team, we were talking about them earlier, you've got a slick machine running here for your business. Yes. We we're touching on your bit of travel plans and obviously how you're going to shoe your horses for the WSB Met before you go to Horseshoe Summit. And you've got it to the point where you've got a team that you very comfortable with leaving in charge behind and just give us an intro on to who, who are the important cogs there and how you just went from a single starting farrier to building up this big business. So I started in Port Elizabeth because Arthur was, was training there and um, it was yeah it was a massive learning curve you know in those days you know whatever wasn't doing really well in any of the other centres landed up in PE pretty much. So I think you, you learn how to deal with issues without any guidance and I think that's what happened is you know you, you start to figure things out. Um, but moving along now and getting to my team, uh, all of my, the farriers that are in my team are qualified. Um, I'm very pedantic when it comes to what we do, where, how we shoe horses, how we deal with the horses that we work on. Um, I think it's very important in that people spend a lot of money on horses. And I think it's only fair for us as farriers to upgrade ourselves to be able to better care for those horses. Uh, my whole, all my farriers in my team are all qualified. Both of my sons are in the team as well. Um, and I think there are five or six of us that, that are getting the horses done. Um, I'm lucky with them. They're actually quite kind to me. Every now and again, they throw me a bone, like they'll let me shoe a lead pony or whatever. But um, yeah, no, for the most part, each guy in the team has horses that he normally shoes and looks after. We do them on a four week cycle and um, we manage them really well. So, and the team, as you saw earlier, I mean, they, they run along like a well oiled machine. Absolutely. Well, you don't get, you don't get the Drakenstein job unless you know what you're doing and the people that you work for. Take us through, I think one important part that 
you know, people that aren't involved in the trade don't really realize or know too much about is the competition aspects and those big tournaments, if you can call them that, the World Championships in Calgary, you have the WSB competitions in the States. You've obviously, you've got a fantastic track record in those events you were telling me about them, top South African finisher, um, et cetera, et cetera. But what disciplines are you judged on? How exactly do those competitions work and judging criteria, et cetera, how does that all work? Okay, so, so you get a number of different shoemaking classes, which is all forging, where you'll get pieces of steel and you'll, you'll forge different types of shoes. Um, those specimens have been sent out to all of the guys a couple of months before, so you have time to practice building those shoes so that you can work your heats out and everything. And what they're looking for, what the judges are looking for, is the shoe that is that closest resembles the shoe that the judge presented or, or, or made for us to copy. So, um, what do they say? Im intima uh, imitation is the best form of flattery. flattery correct. And that is exactly what it is. Okay. So, the best shoe that you can imitate on the judge's shoe is the shoe that gets the highest mark. And as you go through the different classes, you'll make it through to the final, which is where you'll make and fit shoes onto a horse, which is what we do. We farriers and yeah. we shoe horses. And so, you, all of us want to get into the finals where we get to shoe a horse and show off our, our skills as farriers more so than the blacksmith side yes. of it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big thing to get into the, to the shoeing part of the competition. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You've got, I mean, you've got a phenomenal track record. Give me some positions. Boast uh, a little bit. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I've had, uh, I've been the top finisher in Calgary every time I've competed, the top South African finisher, sorry, every time I've competed in Calgary. And then I've got back-to-back um, -back best shot feet uh, at the WCB in the US. Um, that's Craig Turnco who puts that on and it's an awesome, awesome setup. It's one of the best competition environments on the planet. Wow. Um, so it's really great going there and competing. And the thing is, you know, you're not only just competing, you're interacting with other farriers. So whenever you're interacting with your type, you start to grow and develop and or you continue, you absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, there's a lot of value in it from all aspects. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I need to get back and go and have another go. I haven't been there for a while. Don't rest on your so. laurels. You, you know, you got to keep up your reputation. And no mean feat, obviously, I mean, the, co the competition, the level, we're talking about the best of the best farriers in the world. Absolutely. And, 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 and Robbie, within just South African ranks, I mean, I suppose our farriers, you could draw a comparison with our jockeys. I mean, we have we have fantastic farriers in this country who've made their mark around the world, not just yourself. Um, Derek Popard is, is someone that you know quite well. Yes. I was fortunate enough to spend some time with him in Dubai um, at the actual Godolphin headquarters where yes. Charlie Appleby trains. And for the, for the viewers who don't know, Derek is, uh, you know, he's the head farrier out at Godolphin and Dali. Mm -hmm which is obviously a massive horse racing operation Absolutely, and yeah. he's built his own business and he's manufacturing shoes and all the type of stuff. He's a big barefoot man out there. I think it's a bit easier when you're training on Godolphin and the, tra the, the floors are smoother than my kitchen table, yeah. my uh, dinner table. So yeah, I mean, fantastic guy. And I mean, you've obviously known him a long time. He's out there in the, in the world making his mark as well. Yeah, no, Derek, Derek's a phenomenal farrier, very, very intelligent guy. And he's, he's very much an innovator. Um, he's, you know, he, he developed and sort of almost perfected the, the hoof casts. Uh, he's got the 3D pads which are now sold and used worldwide. Um, we've had quite a bit of success with 3D pads here in South Africa as well. Um, so yeah, Derek, Derek is definitely, uh, I, I think he was one of the nominees for the Hall of Fame as well. So, you know, when, you, when you're rubbing shoulders with guys like this, uh, it, it's, it's really humbling to have been, you know, inducted. Well, we're here at Drakenstein and obviously we, we were chatting to Kevin Somerville earlier. I mean, they've built this breeding operation from, now we're talking about mares, stallions, homebreds, racing champions generations now and a testament to that reaching their own pinnacle is a horse like Charles Dickens um, as an owner breeder I mean it doesn't get much better than that he looks like a super horse absolutely you shot him as a foal and your team is in charge of, of shoeing him now yeah no I, I as a foal I looked after him you know growing up and um, we very we're very particular about how we look after our foals here we've got them on a strict four-week cycle 
Every four weeks I look at them. If I have little niggles, I've got some foals that I look at every other week, some foals that I look at every week, and we make little tweaks just to try and get the legs and everything as good as we can. Uh, Charles Dickens now, uh, he's, I was lucky enough yesterday when I was in the yard just to have a look at him over the door and that's about as close as I get to him now. Uh, Corneille, he's one of my farriers, uh, it's actually a son of a very good friend of mine up in Joburg and uh, Corneille shoes him and um, he looks at me, if I go towards the stable he looks at me like what do you want to do here? So, but that's how, how much faith I have in, in the guys in my team is that you know, they can shoe any horse in our practice that I can shoe and I've got full faith in them. Well, that's fantastic because I'm sure in a couple of years you'll be looking at the beach house thinking it might be time for semi-retirement. <laughs> so good to know that you've got the pecking order in charge. And I mean, uh, I suppose we were talking about with Kevin, it's a marketing dream having a horse like Charles Dickens yeah. versus cousin Casey. Never mind all the other top horses that are running the Hollywood Red Skinnies. So hopefully we'll see you there and you can maybe applaud him home. I'll be there for sure. Won't miss it for anything. Well, Robbie, I must say, well done. I mean, it's, it's obviously and it's a massive achievement. So once again, for sure in Hall of Fame. No. Congrats. Thanks and so much. A massive thank you to everything you do for the South African industry. Not just farrier-wise, horse racing, you're a big player and, uh, you know, I think the way the industry is going at the moment, everyone's pulling together and it's, it's so important that everybody sees that not just you know, on, the, on, the, on the race course or in the breeding shed or you know, from the trainers yards, right from the ground up, farriers, jockeys, everybody, everybody there's, there's super levels of skill within the South African horse industry at, at all trade levels and uh, you testimony to that and obviously you're bringing through the next generation of, of farriers which is, which is very, very important to the industry going forward so thank you very much for that. No, no, you're welcome, thanks. If I can just say it's, you know, apart from the youngsters that we've got coming through, you know, when, when I lay, on, lay down my apron, racing needs to have farriers following through but just with regards to the Hall of Fame in induction, it's, it's not only me, yeah. you know, it's, it's all of the farriers here in South Africa that have worked to build up our association and to build up farriery in this country. And build the so, credibility of it up. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. you know, it's, it's to, just to get that, that respect and to be seen as professionals, which we are. Fantastic. Thank so, you very much for your time, Robbie.